You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. Um, today we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, we have a special guest here. It's uh, Joe Zaragoza from uh, Drinking a Bible Study. And uh, Joe is a self-proclaimed uh, sharp dresser. Um, he likes to talk <laughs> about on his show. And I was thinking about clothing the other day and how, you know, different clothing. And Joe, Joe will tell you that, you know, what you dress says a lot about you. And I was thinking about how even the color of clothes uh, sometimes will tell you about a person. It can be the same article of clothing. You know, it can be pants. You know, most people generally wear pants, but if you're wearing plaid pants, you're probably going to go golf. That's probably a good idea. Yeah. 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 Golf. Yeah. But, you know, golfers wear plaid pants. Um, uh, What else? Uh, What's that? You know, if you're wearing a blue shirt with a white collar, you're likely uh, dressed by your wife and you own a business like a large corporation or something like that. You're probably a CEO. Red shirt, you're going to die. Red shirt, you're going to die. Um, but I was thinking about <laughs> this. There is, um, aside from the red shirt thing, I, I don't think there's any item of clothing that the difference in color is, is makes such a statement as the beret. And, um, and Tell us why, Nathan. Th- because, I mean, okay, if you think of people wearing berets, you think of, uh, you know, if you have a black beret, they're probably like a poet. Or a, or a mime. A mime, yeah. Okay. Uh, so performing arts, I guess we could say. Now, here's where it goes. Uh, raspberry. You, you get a specific <laughs> image of a person in a, you know, if their beret would be raspberry. But then if you go green, you got a totally it's... different uh, scenario there if the beret is green. So I wanted to uh, go on ahead and throw that out there because Joe is a snazzy dresser. And we're going to bring him on. So, Joe, what's your take on the uh, the beret situation there? Uh, I'm against. Strongly <laughs> against. <laughs> like any beret? Uh, yeah. Um, again, just the mimes in Che Guevara. Just right there. Just bad. It's, it's like no yeah. good. Oh, man. Right I didn't there. even think about Che. I yeah. Guess... That, that famous picture of him wearing the, the, the silly, silly hat. Yeah. And, you know, and yeah, on all those uh, young children who uh, have no idea uh, what he was really like. And it's just it's just bad times. It's all bad times. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm just not a not a, not a fan of no, the beret. Did we just break our no politics oh, rule? Man, I think we kind of did. <laughs> I know like... that's not politics. He, he, he was very rude to waitresses and waiters. Uh, oh, that's, you know, no that, good. that's not political. He was. Yeah, he. Uh, yeah, it just not he would never tip. He was just not not a good man. Uh, well, that that's fair. I was, I was thinking specifically about the green berets because yeah, you know, it, the, that, yeah, that's yeah, a the totally military different. thing. Yeah. I, I think uh Arnold Schwarzenegger wore one in Commando. Yeah. That that old 80s action <laughs> movie. <laughs> and and who doesn't love Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yeah. He I'm just going to he, he encourages you to go to the helicopter. You know, <laughs> under certain situations, he he's adamant about not having a tumor. <laughs> well, so, about himself not having a tumor. I don't know if that does that apply to the general populace. Yeah, I, I know he was talking about himself. And he'll always yeah. be back. And, right. Yes, and he, you know, he'll he'll he reassures you. I I I'm gonna be right back, guys. Yeah, he he'd, you know, he'd be I'm, great I'm, with kids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I actually have a friend who voted for Schwarzenegger as governor because he wanted Schwarzenegger's signature on his diploma. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> okay. Now I had a, I had a friend who was out there who, who he, he said he voted for Schwarzenegger as a joke because he didn't think that he would win and he thought it would be <laughs> funny to vote for him. Um, and now I, I don't keep up with California politics, so I don't know. I, I have very little, you know, I, I don't know how he did or not, but um, but yeah, I thought that was kind of funny. He was like, he's like, yeah, you know, he was like, I, I voted for him as a joke and I didn't think he was going to win. And then when I saw it, he won, I was like, oh man, I, maybe I, maybe I should have voted for someone else. 
Yeah, yeah, we're we're really crazy out here uh, in California. We voted for Jerry Brown, Jerry Brown, and Ronald Reagan. So yeah, we we don't know what we're doing. We we always vote Democrat when it comes to president, but when it comes to governor, yeah, it, it swings left and right. <laughs> well, that, that's funny. I, I should maybe I should keep up with it. It might be more entertaining than what goes on in Oklahoma because we're you know we're pretty consistently red out here. Well, you know, what's really funny, though, is when you start doing family trees and stuff, you find out that, like, most of the Okies moved to California and, like, certain parts of the family remained in California. Mm -hmm. And then the other part came back. So there's, like, actually a lot of ties. So it's kind of odd that we're at such opposite ends of the spectrum. So, yeah. Well, yeah. th there's yeah. actually a lot of red out here in California. I mean, the, the major cities, of course, like anywhere else, it's very, uh, you know, very blue. But then, the, you know, Orange County, for example, it's a, a higher class neighborhood or higher class uh, towns uh, or county uh, where, well, unfortunately, it's where white flight went after more minorities started moving to Los Angeles. Uh, but there's, and, you know, there's a lot of rural areas in California. Like, that's why I love California so much, because you can literally go to the snow, uh, go to the beach, go to the forest. You can, you know, we're close to everything out here. Oh, it's right. a gorgeous state. Joshua Tree. Yeah, yeah. And it's all within the state. And again, we have a diverse uh, population of thought. And, uh, and even Los Angeles itself has a huge diversity in race, which in uh, national nationalities, which is why we have so many amazing restaurants. I you will can really, I literally find all kinds of food here. Korean all different kinds of Chinese foods, because again, China is a huge state, right? A state, a huge country with lots right. of different Are they 52? types. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, from all different regions in, in China, uh, you have Indian, Indonesian, uh, you know, Ethiopian food. You can find it anywhere here. And Cause see, now so, you're speaking my language. Cause when we start talking yeah. food, I'm, I'm on board. Yeah, it's it's yeah. Mickey and uh, my, my wife Mickey. Uh, we're the same way. We're we're food people, and and it's really funny. We tell people like, "Hey, we're going on a trip." They're like, "Really? What are you going to do?" I'm like, "Well, we're going to go to the Kalachi factory, and then we're going to go to the sushi place, and then we're going to go to this pub, and then we're <laughs> and and yeah. uh, that's the stuff I'm excited about." And and Mickey's a, a lot the same. We we love good food, and so yeah, yeah, I I. I definitely need to travel more. I I used to travel for work, but now I'm kind of I'm kind of a homebody lately. Well, that happens when you have munchkins. Yeah, yeah, a lot of it is the kids, which I wouldn't trade them for the world. Most days. There there are some days that I do kind of miss <laughs> being on the road and just going, "Hey, that place looks interesting. Let's eat there." Yeah. So you so can definitely do that here in California. So, so yeah. aside from food, we actually we got Joe on here because yeah, we should we should talk more about yeah what Joe's doing. Um, so yeah. uh, Joe, as I mentioned at the beginning, he is uh, one of the hosts of the podcast Drinking at Bible Study, and mm -hmm. it's a great little show there. And um, the reason, and I want to kind of talk about the reason we had Joe on. There's a couple of reasons. Number one is even though Joe has this uh, nationally famous podcast. Uh, drinking a Bible study, we connected in a Facebook group, and and when Emily and I were considering launching uh, Faith and Other Oddities, we needed help, and yeah. uh, and so we just we messaged Joe, and he's never hesitated to offer us any advice that he has. Um, and the other reason is uh, the for those of you not familiar with the format of of drinking a Bible study, Joe is more evangelical, his uh, his co host is more progressive, and they disagree on a lot of things. And I think it's, it's a really good uh, exercise for Christians to have good conversation with people they disagree with. And so if you ever want a good example of someone who's going to have a dialogue with someone they disagree with and still not back down on what they believe and the things they disagree with um, without being... Uh, I was gonna say, you're still with, maintaining the relationship. Still There's maintaining still the level relationship. Of respect. Yeah, and, and without without attacking the other person, um, this is a great show to listen to if you need uh, a little bit of guidance on that. Joe, I, I wanted to share that with you live. I didn't tell you that before, but that's one of the things <laughs> no, that yeah. I do like about your show because 
that's something that I still struggle with is not is, you know, everyone has that thing where like, oh, I need this person to understand that I am right. And uh, I think you do a really good job on your show of of not just, you know, uh, going after your co-host uh, when you disagree. And she does a great job of that uh, with you as mm-hmm. well. Um, yeah. yeah, we and so that's that's one of the things that keeps me coming back is listening to that and that I can recommend it to my friends and say, hey, uh, check this out. It's a it's a great way to look at at conversation and dialogue with people you disagree with. Yeah, well, um, there was even an episode uh, in the la- in a while ago where I actually admitted I was wrong about something. Uh, Surely not. It was yeah, and it was like because we were talking about Jesus's messiahship, whether he was the messiah or not, and how clear that was. And I said in the Old Testament, it made it really clear that Jesus, that the you know the messiah was going to come and he was going to be killed, and he you know it says the Son of God in you know and blah 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 and i was just so adamant that it's so clear in the old testament that jesus was the messiah and so we went to isaiah 53 and you know brandy read it she's like she was reading through it and she's like look it's talking about a king which i get but it doesn't necessarily mean messiah and i'm like of course it does of course it's it does. <laughs> and then uh, you know like, like in this recent episode where we're going back going through um uh acts I kind of said I was wrong about that. I I thought that it was super obvious by, you know, if you read the Old Testament that Jesus was the Messiah, but it wasn't. It, you know, like I the more I studied it, the more I talked to other people. Yeah, it, it you know, I'm wondering why Satan was okay with killing Jesus or why the the Pharisees were so dumb about what was happening. And mm-hmm. because it wasn't clear well, it I, wasn't clear, and so that's what I and I just had to and I had to bring it up to her because she was like really questioning. I understand that you believe that and I, I get that, but if we're reading just the words on the page, it's not that clear, right? So yeah, and so I had I had to like give it to her. I said, yeah, I'm really sorry. I, I was I was wrong. You were right, and yeah, and so because again, we're friends, and I respect her, you know. <laughs> opinions and all well and yeah and we got to respect that too that's that that's a hard thing to do well Uh, i and i think that's one of the things that having uh friends who don't necessarily share our viewpoints and faith they keep us honest and they make us go back and re-examine what we think we know because we bring all the baggage the new testament baggage to the old testament and Mm -hmm. so we start saying oh this is what it means but somebody outside of our faith who wasn't schooled in that can say no wait a minute and, and really point out to us some of the things we've taken for granted and the traditions that we've built up around the text. So yeah, I, I think it's really good that we can have those kind of conversations. Well, yeah. I mean, just a recent example, uh, Antonin Scalia and uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, complete opposites. And they were best friends. They hung, they went on vacations together. And like, I think uh, in his eulogy, she called him her buddy. Yeah, you know, and they had, and the reason was, was that when she wrote a dissenting opinion for a law that passed or something, she said, I always had him read it because if there was anything wrong with what I wrote, he was going to find it. Right. And it just made her a better judge. And she made him a better judge. And they were, again, he was completely conservative and she was totally liberal. And yet they still were able to have this amazing friendship. And and help each other be better at what they do. That actually reminded me of the rabbinic story. Uh, of when the one rabbi died, they, there was two rabbis, and they were always at odds with each other. Was that Hillel and Shemaim? I, I can't that? remember. I, I would hate to say the names and have them wrong, but I, I do know that they were so on opposite it's ends. It's possible it was them. If not, it was someone else. Exactly. Yeah. If it wasn't them, absolutely somebody else. <laughs> and so, uh, but they were always at each other and arguing over the different interpretations of scripture. And one of them died and everybody thought, oh, well, the one who was still alive was going to be um, relieved not to have this person who argued with him. And he actually went to the seat where the, his dead friend used to sit and would kiss the seat and talked about what a great treasure that Israel had lost in that day. And I think that's one of the things that we as Christians, we, we have lost the ability to have those kinds of heated debates about an issue mm-hmm. without attacking a person. 
and you had a really good analogy. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but basically the the idea is we you know we we in America, particularly online, Twitter, Facebook, things like that, we don't argue. Um, we attack each other, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the you know I always think of you know it's important that we learn how to argue because um, arguing helps us shape our thoughts and the 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 idea that I had was, you know, we talk about iron sharpens iron in, in the old Testament. And, you know, a lot of us think of this idea of we, we take a, a kitchen knife and we run it over the sharpener that's built into our butcher block. And that's how we sharpen things. But, you know, a sword that was used in battle, uh, you wouldn't do that. You would actually have to take it to a, a Smith and they would heat it up and pound the, the metal out um, because you get knots, notches and chips and you'd have to pound the pieces that were bent back into place and so if you were to just sharpen it like we do today you'd just grind off a whole bunch of useful material and you'd never recover it because it was so fine as slivers that you couldn't make anything out of it and so you would you know when we take an idea out and we we iron sharpens iron we take an idea out and we we have a discussion and we get a little heated but in that time we should focus on the 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 topic and we should pound that topic into a useful tool and that's that's an argument. And anymore, what we do is we take out an idea and we start to heat up the idea. And while one person's trying to work on the idea, we hit that person with our hammer. And that's that's what we do. Instead of arguing, we attack. And I think that's that's an important distinction mm-hmm. um, as yeah. opposed to what we do, uh, what we should be doing. So, OK, so we know Joe can have these great conversations. And I know one of the things we really wanted to ask him about is because you and I are raised in the faith. Right. We, our grandpa was a preacher. Our uncle was a preacher. If there was any kind of ministry going on, we were a part of it. I think I can remember one time I went to four different vacation Bible schools in the same summer because our family members were involved in four different churches. So we had that kind of background. Now, Joe, you, you weren't raised the same way. And you, you came to faith or the evangel- evangelical side of faith later in life. And, mm-hmm. and tell us some of your story. How, how did you get there? Well, um, I was raised Catholic. Um, and so uh, I, I, was, like, I was pretty religious as far as uh, that goes, because my, my dad always gathered me and my brother around this little, you know, picture of the Virgin Mary with a little crucifix. And we'd pray there together. And he'd always read me Bible stories, so I knew the general Bible stories, you know, the the ones that everybody knows, the Ten Commandments, the plagues, the story of Jonah, Jesus, Mm -hmm. uh, you know. And so I always had the belief in God. But at the end of the day, I was just a Sunday Catholic. You know, I'd show up for the 45 minutes, and then I'd leave, and I wouldn't think about it again, unless it came up, of course, because... You know, it's God's always in the back of your mind and stuff. And so I started trying to figure out, okay, if I'm going to be Catholic, I want to be a real Catholic. So I need answers to some of these questions, like, why do we have to kiss the Pope's hand or his ring when we, if we, if we meet him? Because I think there's a story where Peter, somebody was going to kiss his hand and he said, no, 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 you don't, you don't have to do that with me. I don't remember if it was Peter or Paul, uh, but uh, one of them. And I'm like, but that's that's the first pope. He's the first pope. He shouldn't we kiss? His, why wouldn't we? You know, why does it say not to kiss his hand when, you know, when we have to kiss the pope's hand? And why does it say? Why do we confess our sins to a priest uh, instead of you know to God like the Bible says? And this is how Catholic I was. I got I asked several priests and like church leaders these questions and they told me they just gave me random answers that didn't really make sense to me. Like they said like well it's better to confess to a priest because he's knowledge he knows mm-hmm. what he's talking about it's just good it, it, he can give you good advice and I'm like yeah but that doesn't forgive my sins that's a good idea but I my sins won't be forgiven unless I talk to a priest. So how does that work if the Bible doesn't say that? And they gave me some answer that, again, never convinced me. I was so Catholic that I thought, well, they're just, they're, there's a real answer. They just don't know it. <laughs> like, right. I just, I was so sure that there was a real answer. But these guys, they, they, you know, they're, 
They, they just haven't come up with a good enough explanation for me yet. And then after, like, I graduated high school, there, there was this whole question about, like, them not liking me at, at my church because I belong to, a, a, a like, a youth group for high school students. And I was asking too many questions, and I was like a punk rocker dressed all weird <laughs> at church. And so I wanted to join, join the leadership, and they said no because, you know, I'm a little out there. I'm not a leadership material. So I'm like, all right, they're not answering my questions. And then this happens to, I'm not you know, screwed. Like, I no, 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 thanks. I'm done. And so I stopped going to church. And my mom told me that I have to go somewhere like a good mom does. You know, mm -hmm. I don't care where you go to church, but you have to go to church somewhere. Right. And she actually already became an evangelical Christian because she was talking to a nutritionist what she got breast cancer and she was talking to a nutritionist that helped her you know eat healthier you know to help combat the cancer and and he was a, a an elder at a church and so he invited her there and so she started going there and so she's like just come to church with me see what you think i said sure i went there and you know after the service i liked it i thought it was fine i started asking my questions and all the answers that they were giving me were from the Bible. And I'm like, this is perfect. This is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> you know, so that's that's essentially how I came to be baptized. But unfortunately, my life kind of spun out of control after that. <laughs> right after I got baptized, I got into drugs and alcohol and running around with ladies. I think they call it in country music. Yeah, I know. So. Uh, and then it took, you know, years, like about five or six years of that before I actually started taking it seriously and, you know, actually, you know, like, like I said, taking it seriously, actually becoming a Christian, like doing, following what Christ would have me do. Right. You know? So, so yeah, that's how I, that's where I am now. <laughs> so, okay. Now. I, I totally get the uh, not looking the part and being uh, overlooked in uh, in a lot of the youth group activities and things like that. Um, sure. And now I'm curious. So you said uh, you, you said you know you you had a conversion experience and you started and then you kind of you know fell off the wagon and uh, just kind of started running around doing your own thing. What was it? You, what was it? Is there anything in your life specifically from that point that kind of brought you back into the faith? Yeah, um, it was the fact that all I I had everything I wanted. I I was a I was a big nerd in high school. I didn't have a lot of friends. I you know was super shy, and now I had a lot of friends. Girls liked me. I had girlfriends now. I was having fun, you know, I, I it wasn't uh -huh. like I ended up like in the, you know, a lot of people say that you end up in the gutter, you know, addicted to drugs and alcohol. I was having a great time. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I was really having fun, but I was miserable. I, it was just awful. The, the relationships I was in were toxic. My friends, you know, were good, but we're just perpetuating this need to fill whatever void I had inside. And I think that that's what it was. It was a void. I was also uh, struggling, according to a therapist that I saw uh, after this. Uh, I, I had depression, and I was actually self-medicating myself, and I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to make myself feel better with drugs and relationships and alcohol. And and so I, yeah, I, I thought I, I have everything I want. And I'm still not happy. What, what is happening? What, what's going on? And I thought, the only thing I really haven't tried is, is, my, is really following my faith. I believed it all. I just wasn't doing it. Right. I wasn't following. And so, again, but I was going to church every Sunday. I was being a good, you know, attendee. And, but I just wasn't following it. And so when I started following it, it, that's when I realized, oh, this is what I was missing. This is what wasn't there. And again, it didn't fix all my problems, but I wasn't alone anymore. 
that's what I think it was, is that I'm not alone anymore. And even though things are really still really difficult sometimes and I'll, you know, things don't make sense from time to time, I'm a lot happier than I used to be. So I think that that's really what it was. It was the fact that I, yeah, I, I, it was the only thing I hadn't tried and it's the best thing that, uh, that could have happened to me. That's awesome. So, that, yeah. That's, that's actually, awesome. that's really interesting because a lot of times when, when I hear a lot of, you know, conversion stories, particularly from adults, it, it, it comes from a place of, of panic and it, it's kind of interesting that where you're, you're talking about that it's after you had everything you wanted. It's kind of almost like a, it's almost like an Ecclesiastes type thing uh, where uh, Solomon's talking about, hey, you know, it doesn't matter what you're doing. None of this stuff matters if it's not, you know, if, you, if you're not following God, then it's all empty. That's actually uh, interesting you bring up Ecclesiastes because when I, I started reading the Bible, I thought, this is something I have to read. Uh, well, what came first? I took a, a philosophy class, a philosophy 101 class in my community college, and I read Camus, and I fell in love with Camus. Mm -hmm. I thought that it was great. Like I, The teacher handed us a printout of a chapter, of a chapter from um, uh, the, the myth of Sisyphus. Um, and I loved it so much. I went and got the book and I read the whole book and then I read the stranger and I'm like, just the idea that there is no purpose or meaning. Therefore you have to, the thing in front of you is what the meaning of life is. The thing that's you're doing now, that's the only meaning there is. You're never going to accomplish a goal and everything's going to be answered for you. You're never going to reach a point when everything's good. Mm -hmm. Because there's no purpose, there's no direction, there's no meaning. Therefore, whatever where, wherever you're standing, that's the center of the universe. The person that you you're with is the most important person. Wherever you, whatever you do, that's what matters. And I'm like, this is perfect. This is right up my alley. And so, right after that, I thought, well, I should probably start reading the Bible if I'm going to take this faith seriously. And I'm like, how about something simple from the Old Testament, something short? How about Ecclesiastes? <laughs> and I, it, like, it was almost like a religious experience that the Wait. fact that Ecclesiastes <laughs> was so similar to the, the philosophy of Camus that I'm like, how is this not God trying to speak to me? And granted, it could have been a coincidence, but, you know, I, it, it's, a, it's a crazy coincidence. That I read Ecclesiastes. That's the first book I decided to read. That that's you know, incredible. Yeah, because it, it it's but now did you, and you just came to that on your own to just read Ecclesiastes. Yeah, because it was short and it seemed easy, and it was in the Old Testament because I knew what the New Testament had, had right. to say. I just uh, let me try something from the Old Testament. I read Ecclesiastes because it's only fifteen chapters. They seemed like short chapters. And I'm like, oh my god, ah, this is exactly what I've been thinking about. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome because it's it's really I, I think it's amazing that that's the one that you came across like on your own because I know that uh, it, most Christians I know, if you ask them, hey, what what book should I start with if I'm gonna study the Bible, <laughs> they would they would a lot of them I know would probably say, well, start with Acts or the Gospel of John or the Gospel of John, um, which is it, which would have been totally a, a totally different experience for you than Ecclesiastes because yeah. that book is it, it's dark it's dark it's it's my favorite book mm -hmm. um but me too yeah but I, I think I also think that's kind of funny because I was listening to um I was listening to your show and I I I'm one of those people when I listen to a podcast I have to listen from like the beginning and work my way up oh geez those episodes and <laughs> and so. <laughs> It, well, no, I, no, it's it's fine. I, you know, I get it. it was not the it wasn't something you've been doing forever, um, and so I know you know we're just starting out. This is gonna this is our third episode, uh, so we're still like, what are we doing? Um, Why are we doing this? Yeah, um, <laughs> we're still on a steep steep learning curve, and um, so, uh, but you were you did a study on the Gospel of Mark, and yeah. And it was, I found it really interesting and it was, I thought that was a good one. I don't remember most, 
I don't remember all the specifics, but I remember you you saying you wanted to do that because that was the one in which Jesus seemed really human and and had some anger going on. And you actually quoted uh, was Nick Cave. Yeah, he wrote an introduction to a a printing of just the Book of Mark, which I thought was great. And yeah, um, I, that that became my favorite gospel because it was so raw. It was so, and again, it didn't have many, it doesn't have a lot of quotable verses. It, it, you know, it kind of attacks on the, you know, the resurrection at the end, just like this extra, you know, (laughs) postscript. Yeah, Uh, it's it's kind of like, and this happened, and this happened, and then there was, it's like a, it's like the kid on, on, remember the kid on Animaniacs who would like come out and tell like this, like this, (laughs) like really long story, and be like, okay, bye. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I, I, but I can see that because when you think of the history of Mark, uh, Mark was probably written to the Christians in Rome under persecution of Nero, and they they needed an, not a lot of leisure time when you're under persecution. Yeah, like real persecution, and but they needed to see Jesus as real and tangible and actually affecting change in this world. And that's one of the things that I, I've noticed about Joe since we've we've gotten to know him is you you really want change. And you want to see a God who's active and moving. And I I, I can see how that's important to you and why Mark would appeal to your personality. And so you you like the philosophy, but let's get real and nitty gritty. Yeah. So. Yeah, because again, I I think you've spoken about this before, Emily, that just that idea that if somebody's suffering, you just toss him a couple of uh, Bible verses like coins in a coffee cup and then Mm -hmm. you walk away. That doesn't. That that's not what the Bible was supposed to be used for, right? You know, you don't just toss somebody some coins and then walk away. That you you need to give context for those verses. You need to really explain why those verses are important. And yeah, so yeah, I really appreciate what you said about that too. So cool. I I missed the last couple words. We, the the internet kind of cut out just a second. Oh. So, but what was the very last part of that? About uh, no, um, uh, it's the that um, just tossing like I, I repeated that that just tossing verses at somebody like it was changing a cup. It's it you you need to explain why these verses are important, what mm-hmm. these words actually mean to the people that it happened to. Right, right. It's not just a, a nice little bit of advice. People were suffering at the time that these words were being written. These were really, in context, mattered a lot more than just a nice little, you know, friendly car. reminder that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, well, it, that, that's, yeah, so that's important to me, so. Yeah, and, it, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, I find it, you know, it's one of those things, you know, it's like a lot of times whenever I have people kind of throw these verses at me, whenever I'm going through stuff, is... You know how you can tell when somebody's just memorized a fact versus when they've actually like integra- integrated that material into them, whether they've lived it or not, but whether they've actually like, uh, sorry, assessed um, what they're reading and really integrated it and made it something that has become a part of them. It even, you know, and I'm not, I'm not just talking about the Bible. I'm talking about someone who teaches history or someone who teaches science or mathematics. You know, you can tell the difference between someone who's just showed up and, oh, I just memorized this right before class versus somebody who, who they get, they see that whole picture, even though they're just giving you a brush stroke. People who love, who really love the topic. And I think we need more people like that, particularly in the church. And so we get to see that with Joe in, in drinking a Bible study and some of the things that he's, he's doing. And there was another question I wanted to ask him, and I know we discussed it the other day, and I cannot remember what it is now. Uh, we, we can come back to it. I mean, we're, we really don't actually have an official format yet, so okay. you know, we're kind of loosey-goosey, but um, as it were. But uh, you know, talking about um, explaining things to people, um, one of the things you said you wanted to talk about, which is an, it was also an important uh, topic to me, is you were talking about how coming to the faith as an adult, how, how Christian culture is, is sometimes tends to be uh, a little different. So I want you to go ahead and kind of explain 
explain your journey trying to to integrate into the faith as an adult versus someone who's who's grown up in it. Well, I, I, I often describe it to people. It's almost like moving to a new country or a new state or something, a place with a different culture. Because mm-hmm. literally Christianity has its own movies, its own music, its own language, its own etiquette. And, you know, it's... And, you know, it's really welcoming and, you know, accepting, but it, sometimes it also reminds you that you're not from here. Mm-hmm. You know, from time to time, people tend to just remind you, yeah, but, you know, you're not really from here. So just keep that in mind. And <laughs> it, it as, and again, Christ is not like that. He is totally welcoming and loving and, you know, all the good things, but the people do kind of you know, make that kind of mistake. And I, I, I heard a uh, David Foster Wallace uh, lecture. I think it was a commencement speech to a university. And he told this story uh, at the beginning. He says, um, two fish are swimming in the ocean, uh, to, you know, side by side. And then an older fish, they're two young fish, they're, you know, swimming. An older fish comes swimming past them and says, hello, boys, how's the water? And they nod at him and they swim on. And after a while, one fish looks at the other and says, hey, what the hell is water? <laughs> it's, it's, it's this, but I, I think that the, like that totally reminded me of Christianity in that if you're raised in the church, and it's generational, your grandparents were Christian, your parents were Christian, you're Christian, you're raising your kids Christian, you go to church every Sunday for a few hours, there's breaking of bread, there's the worship service. By, uh, Sunday school, then you have Bible study on Tuesday nights, men's meeting or women's meeting, you know, on Thursday. You have your VBS during the summer. Maybe you go to sleepaway camp. You are, again, you watch the same movies, you read the same books, you read the, you, you read the same article. You're totally so, uh, entrenched in this world. How could it not separate you from the rest of the world? And again, right. being in this culture isn't necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but you need to become aware mm-hmm. that there is a world outside that you're separating yourself from, that, you, that Christ, literally the last thing he said before he went up to heaven, he said, you need to go out there and bring my message to them. Mm-hmm. That's your mission. From now on, it's your responsibility to get out there. And I think, I don't well I don't know if you guys have heard about this but I read an article in Newsweek uh, a couple of weeks ago apparently America's divided. I uh, do you hear about this guys? It seems to ring a bell. <laughs> I must have missed it. No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but and but the whole thing is that if we completely separate ourselves from the world, we can't relate to them. Right? And we can't talk to them. And if there are enemies, then we become, it becomes that much harder to reach out to them Mm -hmm. and for them to relate to us because we don't understand what they're going through or what they're dealing with. And that becomes really dangerous if we're, if our mission is to minister to them. Right. And so for me being growing up in the secular world and now being in the Christian world, I almost feel like I have my foot in both places, you know? Right. Where I'm absolutely 100% Christian, but I still watch secular movies, hang out with secular people, you know, and I watch secular television. And it, I, like, I see this, how the, the world views Christians. Mm-hmm. And it's mistaken. It's, it's wrong the way that they see Christianity. But it's also, we need to fight against that, that view, that... We need to speak out more for, against injustices. We need to be more compassionate. We need to understand what people hear when we say certain things. Not what we mean, but what, what they hear. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, you, you mentioned and that. And so, that, yeah. Well, so you mentioned that it's wrong some of the ways the world sees Christians, but I would, I, you know, I'd say it's, it's also kind of wrong the way that the, the, the church sees the world in a lot yeah. of ways. And it's two, kind of two sides of the same coin. I was actually, I've been listening you know, over the last couple of years, I've been blessed with a janitorial position, um, which 
sounds funny on the surface, but it's allowed me to listen to a lot, a lot of podcasts. And I listen to quite a range of things um, on the, on the political spectrum. And again, Emily and I typically try to stay out of politics because we're already talking about religion and we, we want to have some friends uh, <laughs> sometime. But the uh, one of the lectures I was listening to, uh, there was a question about the right and the left, and the, the lecturer said that we have to realize there is a place for both in our society because the right is always leaning towards, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, um, but the right is always um, trying to establish order and structure mm-hmm. and move things forward uh, so, that, so that we can operate uh, safely and securely. And the left is the voice of those people who get overlooked in the process. And, you know, you can go too far in either direction, but you got to have v- both voices so that everyone can come to the table in order yeah. to figure out how to meet everyone's needs. And this and this is for me. And, and you know, some of my background, you know, is I, I come from a pretty far right background coming, you know, growing up in Oklahoma. And over the last, you know, probably six or seven years, I've kind of been trying to figure out and separate the politics and the religion and figure out where exactly do we fit. And so, yeah, I, I definitely think the church needs to understand, particularly the church that's on the far right needs to see that the voices on the left, even though sometimes they may go too far with some of their tactics, um, that they're trying to voice an, a, a legitimate need. And even though sometimes the people on the right go f- too far with their tactics, um, they're trying to voice a legitimate need and we need to figure out how to meet both of those things uh in a in a way that that can help everyone so sorry yeah. to go on my tangent there but that's... no 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 that's no, this, no, you're totally right because again I, again i'm very left wing i'm to the left of lenin for <laughs> good to say but because i hang out with so many liberals and leftists and stuff i don't want them in charge i don't want I don't I don't think they want the conservatives to go away, that they're always bad. I think we need conservatives to keep us in line, because anything, if if something is completely conservative, like just no liberal voices at all, it gets real stagnant. And, you know, people get over, like you said, people get overlooked. If you go too much to the left, then, you know, you get you then you they start overlooking people because they think that. Some people get too much privilege and too, you know, and again, there's no, there's not enough money to do everything they want. So we need both to maintain order right. with each other. We and again, you're never going to get rid of either side. So we might as well learn to live together. Exactly. It's it's crazy because yeah, it, it's just it's it's crazy what I've been hearing from the left about how. You know, when the church goes away, it's like people are predicting that in 50 years, there's going to be no more Christianity. They're crazy. But if it, but they think that once it goes away, it'll be a perfect utopia where every secularist is going to treat each other well and respectful. And I absolutely don't believe that. Not because I believe that secularists or non-Christians or non-religious people are bad, because I think people are bad. Whenever anybody is completely in charge, things go wrong. Right. You know, whenever anybody gets power, things just break bad. So we need, you know, we need to understand that about ourselves and we need to reach out across to the other people that, you know, that, that, that will help us see our, like I said, like we was talking about earlier, Antonin Scalia and, uh, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we make each other better. And that's exactly. what we need to, you know, to remember. And, and, so, and look, you know, I don't know. If, yeah. No, that, that's <laughs> great because I do think that in, in the church, you know, we can get, we can get, I mean, we can get churches that go uh, too far into politics, uh, you know, on the right and too far on the left, but we just, we need to to understand how to have the dialogue, and like you said, we we need to learn to get along. But I think I think we need to learn to 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 love each other 
better and respect each other to the point to go, oh yeah, that's part of the equation and I missed that. And and also being able to to sometimes go, you know, we don't all have to be doing the exact same thing because there are ways that maybe you're gifted in taking care of this type of problem and I'm gifted in taking care of this pr- type of problem. And so I think that's why we have you know, such a variety in churches and things like that. But so. Well, and I also think that a lot of times you just, like we were talking at one point, the vocabulary. Oh yeah. There, there's, there's a huge gap in vocabulary. And while Joe was talking, I was thinking, uh, when I was in seminary, I was uh, in a break room with a girl who uh, said she was called to work with drug addicts. And um, I came rushing in during a break. I'm like, I'm Jonesing for a Mountain Dew. And she went, you're what? I, she she had never heard that term before. She she'd grown up in a very Christian home, and so I started going down different names for marijuana, and she had never heard them. And I'm like, how are we going to be taken seriously with people who are recovering from addiction problems if you don't know the basic terminology? And, and I'm just things that you would pick up on TV or in the movies, but she'd been so sheltered from this, she didn't know how to have these conversations, and. I think that's one of the things we're watching the secular movies and watching the secular TV. We can stay informed enough to have meaningful conversations. And I think a lot of Christians are kind of scared of that sometimes. Well, I'll, I'll see your uh, jargon story and I'll raise you this one. Um, oh, no. <laughs> so, um, uh, this is not actually mine. I borrowed this from, from my wife. She said uh, she actually knew someone that uh, she was a, preacher's daughter I, I never met this person but apparently she knew this girl in college who was preacher's daughter and um was like sleeping with her boyfriend but she didn't know she was doing anything wrong because she sat through all these sermons and all they ever the only word they ever used was fornication but no one even knew what the word fornication was <laughs> and so in her mind she's like well you know I, we're we're just spending time with each other. And uh, yeah, so, so that's, you know, when you talk about the jargon, I mean, that's, that's a, a throwback word like way back in the day. But I mean, that's, I think about how displaced in time that congregation was and that this poor girl didn't even realize that, you know, this was something that she probably shouldn't do because it wasn't explained to her what that meant. Well, that's the other fault Christians have. We like to use these arcane and obscure words. Euphemisms. The euphemisms, which is a nice way to say something naughty. And killing, which is, euf- euphemization, that's the killing of language. Um, sorry. Go on, Joe. You had pun. something to add. I'm sorry. I totally ruined it. <laughs> my bad pun. <laughs> but, you know, I, mean, I think when we, when we stop speaking plain language, and dare I say, even um, I don't want to say crass, common, common language, because even common language used to be looked down on. But when we stop speaking well, I common mean, language, yeah, vulgar, the vulgate, mm-hmm. the common language, we miss something. And so I think when we have people where, you know, Joe, you're talking about your background and things that you were doing, you have enough experience that when you come to the table, you can ask the questions that matter, the, the, the questions yeah. that penetrate to the heart of an issue where a lot of times if you're a good Christian, you're just going to talk around it because that's what you were trained to do. Mm. So, yeah, you, you hint at it and hope that the other person will confess their sin in plain words kind of thing. Is that? Is yeah. That... <laughs> well, um, I find that it's really the thing that really sucks for Christians. This is really, really awful and difficult, but it, the burden is on us to reach across. We just have to. And I know it, it, for the left or for liberals, people who don't like uh, Christians, yes, morally speaking, they should reach out and try to bridge a gap, you know, this gap, but they don't have to. Morally speaking, right. they can decide whether they should or shouldn't. But for us, we have no choice. We have to reach across. That's really and good. That's, so that's a great so, point. Because th- that's what that's what's so difficult about what Jesus taught us is that, oh, it like everything he said goes totally against our human nature. It 
it does not make sense. Love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. That goes against everything we want to do. You know, yeah. when when God when God told jo- Jonah to go to Assyria to bring the message of God to the Assyrians, that's insane. What are you talking about? No, right. the, like it's almost like like Jonah was like in in his body, he was right to say, "No, I'm not going to go over there because." Those people are bad, and they don't deserve it. But that's what makes God God, is that he says, my message is for everybody. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that, that's kind of the thing about when Jesus and Paul talked about persecution, a lot of Christians kind of misinterpret that. They think that persecution is like, you know, it, it, we're going to be persecuted, so watch out. And so all these Christians are worried about losing their religious rights or their religious liberties. They want to put somebody that will protect them. They want to stay away from the outside world to protect them. But honestly, if we're reading what the message of Paul and and Jesus was, was, guess what, guys? You're going to be persecuted. Now, mm-hmm. get going. Keep going. No, right. no, no, don't stop. Keep going. <laughs> I I just thought you should know that. Well, it, it, but it wasn't. It wasn't protect yourselves. It wasn't stay away from them. It was that's yeah. It sucks. It's a bummer. Now get out there. Yeah. And I think that Christians don't realize that that's what they're supposed to do. They keep you know worried about. I mean, you, you know, we call it the persecution complex. But in America, it, it, it's you know even if we were, even if Christians were persecuted, that's that's a bummer, man. But you got to get back out there. Yeah, and, and that's what's, yeah. No, that that's good. And one of the things I thought I thought was kind of interesting. You're talking about you know following Christ's example and things like that, and and being the person, to, the, being the people to go into the world. Um, one of the things that 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 reminded me of you you're like you know it's like Jesus Jesus left heaven to go into the world, and to we deal with us and Jeez. to yeah to deal with us. <laughs> and and we and we aren't even re- willing to li- to leave the church and I, and I'm going to I'm not you know I'm going to guess compared to heaven church actually kind of sucks. I mean that's <laughs> comparatively speaking. I yeah. mean relatively speaking um just the donuts alone are better in heaven than what we provide at church. <laughs> I'm going to choke here. <laughs> I should I should hope so. <laughs> But, I mean, they got bear claws and they got like swirly things. It's <laughs> it's wonderful what they have in heaven. We just have like maple bars, although, which is fine. Although our, uh, Don't knock the maple bars. Although the church we're no, going, no, I love maple bars, but although the church Mickey and I are going to right now has Rudy's barbecue, uh, brisket, egg and cheese tacos at the breakfast thing, and uh, if you're okay, not, ha- then, then then that's getting close. <laughs> we're, yeah, getting close. so uh, I mean. <laughs> It's it's but that's yeah, and and the thing is they get them. I don't know if they're like buying them in bulk at a discount, but they're like cheaper at church than they are at Rudy's. Rudy's not a sponsor of the show, but um, but they're so good. If you, I never would have thought to put brisket and and egg and cheese in a little breakfast taco, but uh, whoever did that, uh, Rudy, I guess is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I, Sorry. I, I just I, no, <laughs> derailed I remember, him <laughs> No, I remember there's, I, I had this conversation at Bible study where we were reading about, I think it was Paul was going into a, a, a city and this prophet came to him and he took off Paul's belt and he tied himself up mm-hmm. and he, you know, and he said, when you, like, when you go in there, this is what's going to happen to you. Like, you're going to be bound, you're going to be beaten, it's going to be terrible. And then we wondered, well, then if he got that warning, why would Paul keep going? And the answer for us that we came up with was because he wasn't telling him not to go. Right. He was just telling him this is what's going to happen. Yep. Just so that, and, you know, and we mistake that into thinking, well, Paul disobeyed an order from God. God didn't tell him don't go, God didn't tell him to go somewhere else. Right. God told him this is what's going to happen to you just so you know. So just, now, like I said, get going. And that is just, Im- imagine if Christians were to follow that. It it would be a game changer. Yeah. And, and again, it's 
it's it's not about reaching the people who hate you. It is everyone else who watches that conversation. If you're talking to an atheist and you're 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 humble, your words are 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 well you know well spoken and you're intelligent and you're relatable and you try to reach him. That person might be mean to you. That person might never be converted. That person might say horrible things to you. But since we're living in the world of the internet, you're not the everyone's watching. Yeah, that... And you might not touch that person, but somebody watching that conversation might see it. That's and a... that's why that matters. See, that's actually interesting because we just uh Mickey and I are going to a class about the Gospels, and that was actually one of the things that was very interesting uh, the, that the teacher brought out was sometimes uh, the conversations Jesus had with some of the people weren't at all for the person he was talking to. And yeah. so that's actually really a, a great parallel and a, and a good point. Um, so I like, I like that. That definitely seems well, to line up. Yeah, because there were times when he pulled people aside and had like little small conversations with like, you know, with Peter just just the two of them or peter and some of the other disciples but yeah you're right every parable every discussion was happened happened publicly for everyone and yeah it's yeah spectacular yeah just a great example of what we should be doing yeah exactly well um i hate to rush things but we're kind of running up on our time and uh sure so a couple things uh you know, we talked about uh, a couple of reasons we wanted to bring Joe on. One that he's one just been a great help to us. Two, I I do think Joe, you have been uh, doing a great job of basically example you just talked about. And 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 one thing, you know, one of your early episodes, you you actually faded the episode out and said that it was because you you kind of were losing control of of the conversation. You were starting to get angry, and I and I I think that's commendable. But uh, you know. Almost every other time that I've listened to the episode, you've been very patient and and understanding. And and again, Brandy has been of your your viewpoint point too. And so I think that the you know I recommend anyone listening to us check out Drinking a Bible Study if you want to hear uh, and a good example of how to approach people who differ from you. Um, so that th- those are the the two big reasons. One that he helped him. Two, it's, it's he's putting putting forth a great example there. Um, but there is a third reason um, that we wanted to have Joe on the show. And Joe, I'm going to let you uh, make the announcement uh, of what we've got coming up here. Sure. Um, so I, I used to do a movie podcast long ago, about a year ago, according to Facebook memories. Um, but uh, I used to do a podcast called The Commentarians. And that name was given to me by Nathan. That was a great idea. And I love that name. Oh yeah, that was that uh, was I, me, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you you came up with that. Oh, fun. <laughs> and um and it was basically a movie commentary podcast for Christians where we I would invite a friend over and watch a movie and we would literally record the conversation we're having while watching the movie. Now, the thing of it it was was that I already had another podcast drinking a Bible study and I thought if this was going to be once a month it might not take so much time, but I was wrong about that. It was very overwhelming uh, having to do both podcasts, even though the other one was month, once a month, it became really difficult to actually do. And so I only did five episodes. And the, But every one of them I'm super proud of. They're great. I had Emily on to talk about Cabin in the Woods. I had uh, Nathan on to talk about Moana. I had a couple of other people. We did God, God's Not Dead and uh, old fashioned and passion of the Christ. It's just a great podcast. It was fun. Yeah. And, but I gave up doing it, but it's, but it's still on iTunes. If you guys want to check it out. Now, the reason why I'm on, uh, one of the reasons I'm on this podcast is because it's coming back. Uh, thanks to, uh, Emily and Nathan, uh, they're helping me bring it back, uh, under the, uh, the wings of the Raven. <laughs> I knew the wings of the <laughs> and uh yeah so it's going to be coming back it's going to be the same thing a monthly podcast with a little bit of a difference and maybe you guys can talk about that so the difference is uh so i do a lot of thinking and a lot of podcast listening as i mentioned before and one uh, and and i i 
when I go to work, I queue up a day's worth of podcast on the Play Next in my uh, in my thing. I've got my headphones in, cleaning, doing different projects all day. And one day, I happened to see the uh, the the commentarians uh, logo um, because I hadn't listened to the last episode, and I was thinking about it about how much I enjoyed list. Not you know, I was a guest and I enjoyed being a guest, but I really enjoyed listening to the other guest and what they had to say because there is so much in in movies and i I got to thinking about it i thought well what's a way that that could come back and so i thought well maybe if they're a rotating host so i I called emily and asked her what she thought about it then i messaged joe and said hey joe do you have time for a phone call and given my experience of pitching ideas to people, I expected to kind of pitch this idea to Joe and then never hear about it. Have him run screen for the hills. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I pitched this idea that maybe uh, Joe can find two other hosts. And I was hoping it would be me and Emily. Um, but if not, <laughs> if he would have taken this idea to two other hosts, I would have been happy. He liked the idea and ran with it because I like the podcast that much. But uh, so starting uh, November 1st is when you're going to see uh, if you've watched, if you've listened to the show, you're going to hear the coming attractions. We're going to announce what movie we're going to do. Um, but uh, basically, Joe and Emily and I are going to take turns rotating as host so that we don't no one has to book this a guest every single month. Uh, we only have to do one of these a quarter, but we can still deliver a quality podcast and get yeah. this thing going, because I, I in my opinion, it was too good an idea to die. Well, and I've and, been telling people it's been ahead. like mystery science theater for Christians. Yeah. I, and they all go, we love that show. And they're so excited to see what we're going to do. And yeah, I, I had a friend call it mystery, the uh, mystery theology theater. <laughs> 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 um, but, um, but yeah, so it's, it's coming back and Emily and I are basically going to be kind of taking over two thirds of it. Uh, we're going to be adding some extras in there. Um, for uh, Patreon supporters, but uh, yeah, November first we're gonna do that. But I was I was just blown away whenever I pitched this idea to Joe, and he was like, "Oh my gosh, I love it!" And and not only did he say that because I've had a lot of people say, "Oh my gosh, I love that idea," and then I ne- then they like they're just like it's like they throw a smoke grenade and they're gone. But Joe like kept messaging me. He's like, "Hey, I want to hear more about this idea," and he's like, "When do you think we can launch this by?" So uh, we we agreed on November uh, is when we're going to have the first movie up. Are we announcing the movie? Um, I think we should. Well, should we wait till uh, the coming attractions, Joe? For uh, to see what movie it'll be. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I, I think we should leave that mystery there. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I do I do want to put out this little teaser because number one, it's not the movie you expect for a Christian podcast. And we're going to be talking about some really great controversial ideas politically, socially, artistically, theologically. And I, yeah. I'm really happy about it. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a great time. Yeah, was, oh, go ahead, Joe. No, because I, that's that's kind of the point of the podcast is, well, because what the listener can do is they can actually put it on while watching the movie. Mm-hmm. But the conversation is broad enough that you don't have to. If you've never seen the mm-hmm. movie before, like 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 we said, uh, Emily did uh, did uh, Cabin in the Woods, mm-hmm. a horror movie with me. Some people don't like horror movies, but they really want to hear us talking about why horror movies might be edifying to God or why they might just be entertaining and be okay for Christians to watch. You can just listen to the podcast without watching the movie. Right. And if you want to watch the movie, but you're afraid of like you know some of the content, uh, this is a little silly, but uh, I will tell you when something gruesome or some, you know, salacious scenes are about to come on beforehand so you can look away. We will tell you beforehand if it has anything, like in case you want to see the movie before. We'll tell you the rating. We'll tell you the content. We'll tell you uh, anything you might need to know before you go into the movie in case you struggle with, like, you know, lust or, you know, some things might be triggering to you, you know, violence or gore or whatever so we'll let you know all the information you need to know in the coming attractions which is always comes out on the first of the month and then the movie comes out on the 15th so 
just to give an idea of what uh, what the thing is, what the podcast is. So, and you can like right now, you can go back and listen to our our back catalog because those are still up. Mm-hmm. And I recommend listening to the very first episode, which was an introduction. It's really me talking about why I'm doing this. Yep. So that's those are all still available on, on iTunes. They're still available on iTunes, and they uh, and Commentarians uh, is actually going to be moving uh, to the Raven Creek website. Um, Yep. For uh just helps us out with hosting costs and things like that. Um, but it's gonna be at uh ravencreeksc.com slash commentarians, I believe is the URL. If it's different, I'll put it mm-hmm. that in the show notes. Okay. Great. That's yeah, but I'm I'm really excited about this. This sounds like such a great idea. And again, uh, if you guys like my conversation with Emily and Nathan in those episodes. We're going to do some bonus episodes where we're going to be doing a movie all together. Yeah. And sometimes. And that's here, actually. Here and there, whenever, whenever we can. Right. And that's actually how we're going to kick off. We're going to kick off with a big celebration of me, Emily, and Joe uh, getting together and watching TBA. And, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's not from Arrested Development. It's a different one. <laughs> um, but um but yeah we're we're excited about that and then uh then we are gonna occasionally we're gonna throw in even if there's something like a topic we wanted to discuss on the the movie that maybe uh you know emily had her guest and maybe me and joe wanted to talk a little bit about a movie that she was watching we're gonna throw in some of those extras uh kind of here and there and then we have some even more interesting things to to come along that we'll announce as we go along. And be sure and follow um, the Commentarians has a Facebook page. Yes. Hey, Joe, tell us uh, your shows, where everyone can find you real quick. Okay, so uh, Drinking at Bible Study is at facebook.com slash drinking at Bible study or libsyn.com slash drinking at Bible study where you can stream it. Uh, you can find it on iTunes. Uh, you can find uh, you can find me on uh, Joe D-A-B-S pod on Twitter and uh, drinking at Bible study on Instagram. Commentarians is on facebook.com slash the commentarians. Uh, it's on Twitter at the comments pod and it's on Instagram at commentarians pod. Right. And so those are still up and I recommend following the Instagram, especially because I post pictures of classic Hollywood and old timey movie starlets and scenes, great scenes like, you know, screenshots from movies yeah, I, that's really fun. I think a lot of people yeah, it's like a it is a fun those. Instagram account, and we need to put those um, links up on the Raven Creek Facebook yeah, page. We'll, yeah, we, we'll, so we're getting the the Raven Creek SC dot com is still under construction, so we are adding things all the time. So if you haven't been there lately, you may not have actually been there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Uh, I just... had something, but it flittered away. So I I think mm. that seems like a good place to to uh to end um on a high note good news coming and if you like this conversation there is another one coming to you in a couple days and then another one coming 15 days after that 14 days after that and i was going to say if you follow commentarians be sure and tell us what movies you would like for us to watch we'll yes. take suggestions so yeah. at least i will I, nathan and joe might be stubborn but i will yeah we're we're always open to <laughs> suggestions um and we'll be looking forward to hearing from you. If, and again, if you like what you heard, um, be sure to hit the subscribe button. Uh, you can find us. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Facebook, Instagram. Uh, Raven Creek SC. It's uh, the same handle across the board. Look for us there or RavenCreekSC.com. We'll be happy uh, to hear from you. So thanks for joining us. Hi. Bye. Bye. Faith and Other Oddities podcast, a Raven Creek Social Club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.